Do you drive a nice car? Do you like to go to the spa? Do you sleep alone at night? With your Bible beside? Do you have a big house? With all the dollars that you've compiled? I know you told me that that's all right, but do you think about us at night? Poetry, the Yale NUS College Poetry Recital here for Poetry Festival SG. Um, before we begin, um, we'd really like to thank uh, Eric and all the team in, in Poetry Festival for, for inviting us over this afternoon. I'm Lawrence Epil. I'm the Creative Writing Track Coordinator of, of Yale NUS College, and I would like you, I would like to welcome you uh, this afternoon. I've, I've been involved with building the writing community at, at Yale and US for, for more than four years, teaching poetry. And, and part of the pleasure has always been bearing witness to the development of poets from our small community of writers. And it's with deep pleasure that um, I am helping introduce and, and sharing with the public some of those voices today. What I've noticed in the work of many Yale and US students is a deep commitment to making a positive change in the different communities that we work with. Um, it's been deeply meaningful to see this in poetry too. I've seen in them the willingness to learn and honor tradition, but also to transform it, to look at history unflinchingly and to see connections that are sometimes difficult to see. 
to make space for voices that have not been represented both in our communities and within the community. But more importantly, to really understand poetry as a way of engaging with language, fearlessly, joyfully, sometimes dangerously, in the way that if we allow language its transformative power, we might really change how we view the world and be in the world. Uh, viewers who are watching this will understand as you listen to these voices, the care, but also the risk that these poets are taking with subject matter, with form, and with language. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce to you to the work of Crystal Ho, Han Renjie, Min Lim, Paul Jerusalem, Sean Hu, and Yam. Let's welcome them. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, everyone, for organizing this event and having me here. So I'm Crystal. I graduated from US at the end of last year, and I began writing in earnest at US. So what happened was I met Larry. I decided that I wanted to take a class with him. It was a class in poetry, and from then on, I never looked back. Larry has changed, has destroyed, <laughs> made my life magical from then on. So today I'll be sharing about five poems. Um, there's a mixture of old and new work, and I hope you like that. So, first one. This is a poem that I usually read at the end of the meeting whenever I'm reading one, but this time I decided to put it first. So we'll have to. So, let them not remember us. Will they display us in the chilly recycled air that raises your goosebumps and cracks your skin? Or will we suspend on metal brackets, hanging, have our features vaguely rubbed out on distorted rocks, masquerading as faces? How will they know what types of rocks to use? Will they use the sand lumps where you grew up? Granite that still lines the path where we had our first walk at midnight? Or will they shape us with wires, memorialize how we spoke into metal and sang to glass all those years we lived apart? What do we do when they remember us? Do you think they will model me out of clay, give me curves you will never know? Will they choose based on our skin color? Will I be too tan for any more than terracotta? Will you be marble? Will they think you're deserving of marble? The stone yellow with age? What do I do if they chisel your features so precise, your no slices open the fingers that have learnt your face by heart? As my fingers shred, will they still be able to match me to you, to the thumbprints etch onto every last pair of ticket stubs? When the ink fades and paper crumbles, will they date when the tickets were issued, where our footprints were last found? Will they think to name us? Tokyo Station. We must not wonder if what we have is love. All that matters is how everything with you becomes more truthful. For now I can walk past the crow and stare into its accusing eyes without looking away. And next poem is a new poem that I wrote very recently. I always tell Larry that I struggle writing about Singapore. For some reason, it's just always easier to write about my country when I'm not looking at it from within the confines of my room in the HDB. But here's something that I wrote in the past few months, and it's about coat buttons. Or some of the flowers that we see that are growing by the pavements now that the grass cutters do not come as regularly. So, on coat buttons. One. They've stopped cutting the grass, which is to say they've stopped beheading the coat button. These days, I see more bees than ever as they weave in and out of the thin but fleshy stems, a light on one flower and then the next. Two. As a child, I thought of the coat buttons as false daisies. How the protruding yellow center and the petals with their tooth-like edges never look quite like the perfect curvature of the textbook daisy. Nothing disappoints a child more than finding the fluffy, fruiting body of the coat button, only to learn that no matter how many times you huff and puff, it will never disperse into the wind the way the dandelions do in all of the stories. Three, to test the fiber content of a fabric, all you have to do is burn it. Alternatively, one might read the label on one's clothing to figure out if the soft and cotton-like dress that one is wearing will melt into a lump of hard plastic. Four, with the little bees, I am fairly certain about the single-use nature of their stings. When reinforcing buttons, there is no way to carefully pull the thread through without forcing the needle in. 
Each time, I snatch the needle back on reflex from underneath the translucent layer of my skin and squeeze until I no longer draw blood. Five. To this day, I still do not know for sure if I am allergic to the stings of the yellow jacket. Even if I witness how a yellow jacket will show up for dinner when the meat is served, salted and lightly charred, nothing stops the thought to hold my breath and play dead from forming in my head before I can swat it away. Six. Something about fire will drive the bees away. Incense, the flicker of a lighter, cigarette ashes, cremation. But remember how the coat buttons will cluster two days after the mowing begins again, falling out of a grass cutter's pocket. 12 days, or the paper screen. Naked pebble, pitter and patter, raindrops fall, a hollow rattle. Walk around the rocks, small step, find drizzle, incense up the nose, a prayer, a perch, ash flecks in water, ice prick, then tear, clouds swirl into sky, riding waves, waning river water, crashes against rock, frosted glass to froth, learn never to turn back on the moon crossing river. Toss a five yen coin in here for a prayer. Two claps, one bow, one final murmur. Two brown ducks on spilled silver light. Do not look, do not linger, you must not speak to her. But watch the stalking heron whisper, no, gamble. The Kamo River will flood over 12 days, 12 days later. And last poem, Dinner at the Taverna. I must admit I gave up my share of rice, for it was neither white nor fluffy enough. But the moment the four of us sliced into the same fish, we unequivocally became family. While the table here isn't quite as round, no dish alight if not for sharing, my mother too would have beamed the same way over another plate of hand-picked greens. If the fish was steamed instead of fried, I'd have skinned it for the table. Leave the flesh clean off the bone with a mere flick of the chopstick. Though you find it hard to watch me pluck the cheek off and carve out the tender pieces underneath, know that this much rice will always be yours. We didn't leave any mussels today, but we remembered the tzatziki. Grilled bread for you and the cat. Two cuts of fish. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, for that really wonderful reading. And, and it's such a great pleasure to be able to read our poems. And thank you to all who are watching now for your attention and for your care for words. Uh, my name is Ren Jie. I graduated um, just a few months ago uh, from Yale NUS, and I, I'm part of the class of 2020. Um, and in this time, um, as, as I look back in my time in Yale NUS, I think I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be encouraged and deeply challenged by a writing community built with of different kinds of writing. And it amazes me each time I think back to my time in the school, the way that um, this small community nurtures and welcomes writers of different concerns and questions. And for me, I think these questions and concerns has influenced my own writing and, 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 and I'm grateful for that time there. So I'm going to read a few of my works. It's a mix of uh, older poems, but also some new. And the first poem that I'm going to read is entitled, Meanwhile. Meanwhile. When cleaning that afternoon, she pieced together the shades of an old closet, pictures molding like the piercing of powdery shards. Meanwhile, the day lies distended, swathed in steam, the yawn of an old kettle, metallic coils like the thin winding of a red bird, thin bubbles touching the specters of silverfish. Eat away man, woman. Eat away bloated surnames transfusing in slitters to our new names. The slow stain of oil glimmering in hues like some bowl of trees, like my mother, some brittle fingers grasping at the lungs. Some glimpse when one squints at faded boots, pirated Nikes, a holiday turned to exile. Superimposed then on lazy Sunday afternoon, this photograph, this dark overrun of time. Meanwhile, the neighboring block scatters like a child's ball blanched in the heat of sun. The mindless plop of aeroplanes, a shuttercock, the twinge of badminton strings held taut, the exhausted cry of a bird at dawn, and father sleeps ever at noon, a hand over the scars. The next poem that I'll read is entitled Hand Towels. The anxious trickle, dark stains of water, gentle with stagnancy. Skin you twist in your brittle turns, knuckles 
scarred and leathery collection to unfold the stricken waves of a jade bangle. Beads flow into globule-like claws, a towel slimy with debris, loose splashes of curry stronger than heaven. And I hesitate to ask, do you remember ghosts? But downstairs, cars gobble voices. Your moldy mop quivers, strands tinged with an arthritic moan, devouring lemon bleach droplets, leaks of blackened rain. And you wipe your eyes in the harsh call of a minor cry. Towels conceal your crosses, that milky glance of loose threads, fabric spooling the cut piece, a small ration of a blue sky. In my poems, uh, I'm very interested in narratives of family and the way that poetry allows us access into perspectives and people different from ourselves. And in this next poem called Return and Escape, I think about what it means to flee from disaster and I imagine myself within that. This poem is, ent is entitled Return and Escape. Uncertain for the search of family members, you glance at the baby, straddled in burnt drabs of nursing cloth. Oh, to return, mother, father. Oh, to grip your paws as branches, miniature hands curled round a wilting collar. Wrinkles of hand-wrung prayer, murmured amens, a hitch insisting protection. Rinse me sharp in crack rims, flopping sirens falling like the spray of talcum. Rip me the bulbous ooze of darkness, cursed figure of an ashborn smile. In halogen lamps bloom your abrasions. Melt me in the shadow of your intonations. I swim in the river of your cataract. And it is I, son. As I think about this current crisis, I'm also thinking about how I might consider well this pandemic. And that's been something that has been really occupying me over these past few months and definitely for many of us. And in this poem over here, I think about this line that I recently heard about theology of all things about God of all things. And it's this line that I recently heard called Theology Speaks to the Hurting. So this is a poem entitled A Theology for the Bruising. Theology speaks to the hurting, my pastor said, twisting then the words in the dim incandescence, the fog of a mind stretching past rows. I scribble saltwater hymns. I scribble the seeds of lament. Theology speaks, mother, to your roving finger and trapment in stream. Your cages of white I burn in a pastor's tongue, the multi hallowed phrase, like raking the leaves, like eye-lying corpses. This Sunday morning, theology speaks to the cough, a checkered shirt, a patterned burst of blood, a cynical snore cloaking a lady, a man. Nearby, another doll, the frayed ends of a cardigan betraying an anxious turning, make up for the grief, the burning, the hurting. My glassy eyes, my blinding at stroke lights, some redemption in the scarf knees, oscillating a lamb bathed in dust, reaches ever to the light. And in, a, and in my final poem, um, I, as I consider well this um, <laughs> past few months of isolation, um, yeah, and this follows well from the previous poem where I think about what it means to think about these things in a theological sense. And this final poem is, is entitled A Theology of Isolation in Pandemic. Easter Sunday, 2020. Distraction, language shafts, dry moat mops, stiff hair blades, reed stock shards, twice beholden, sanity, sweat blood, sanitize, red spot, double check bathroom floors, sanitize my sleep, whimper dash white, holy thoughts, crowding, damn spot, hand treaded, sound ripple, rip, very flame, double check bathroom floors, day of cleaning, cuff faces, stricken, cry porcelain, cry hanging cross, dirt Wednesday, double face cut, triple alert detergent, razor bones, nailed the mind, sold, severant, heat, longing. Thank you. Thank you, Renzi. Thank you, Larry. Um, thanks to Poetry Festival. My name is Min. I graduated Yon in 2018. Oh God. <laughs> um, I've been working on a manuscript. I say that then and I say that now. It's the same manuscript. <laughs> um, 
read a lot about bread and history. Um, Larry has, interestingly for this, been the one who gave me a lot of like Yoda advice on what to do. <laughs> so yeah, it's gonna be a long form piece. So I'm just gonna read like an excerpt of it, and that's that's my whole thing. Okay, so um, it's called What Have I Done. My parents refused to feed me gardenia growing up. When my roommate microwaves her sandwich, I ask whether her mouth resembles her mother. There are a few advantages to eating good bread. First, it tastes good. Scientists have recently discovered that a sourdough diet is a superior effect. The bacteria and lactic acid in the body built up in a slow rise making it easily digestible. Good bread is eaten on its own. The science of it belongs to my father, but I name it only child syndrome. When the Romans invented sourdough, they say to take the sick from the air and to leave it to leaven until it sours. What sickness takes a human to taste the raw belly of bacteria colony and think, Tang, who leaves the bread? I ask my mother's mouth on behalf of my mouth, bread abreast between us. The claim that Romans invented sourdough is wrong, but also right. Sumerians at the southernmost crumb of Mesopotamia have been ingesting bacteria colonies since 6000 BC, 6077 years before the earliest Roman recipe. Egyptians may have invented the oven for bread baking, 3,000 years after Sumerians tamed the Mother East. In 2019, 2020, my claim to fame will be a new bacterial strand to reek my mother's flower. Sources differ, scholars say, bread making leaves behind little evidence. Have you ever seen a gardenia loaf go bad? My mother's mouth likes to wrinkle when she sends fatty food. I learned this trick with mine when she leaves the crust of my French country loaf. Some say an only daughter has no choice but to be filial or mother. History has no say in who invented the sourdough. The Romans may have colonized all the bacteria in the Mediterranean once, but look at who is writing the sourdough poems now. To the girl who wore my body, I write to you in haste. Please forget my name. Where I come from is further away than wherever I've come from. For this letter, I've put down all I know about trust. When my two hands touch, they never ask for my feelings. My two knees keep meeting, so I walk wrong. I don't have a kitchen where one of us holds our chest of knife. No supper full for bellies to arrive at our laps in between thighs to fill a gap. I grow wheat to lose them to the weeds. My sunflower's wicker basket worn two dark eyes in love with her face. My name? My letter has nothing to do with our father's approval. My girl. A girl does not forget her two holes. At the toilet, I lay what loaves I've lost like a bouquet. Here is the garden. I tend to my sunflowers. Here, the letter to our father. To us both, I ask, we forget that he was there first. He was there before me when I laid my bare name wet, when my hands knocked on each other and my knocking knees spilled out his house. I played your body for a fool, paid no more attention to your chest. Your knives are sharp, but I await their return, as if I were your father. He who understands your insights have already split. Number one, in 6000 BC, under the first full moon of a baby's birth, the Sumerian village chief guides a horse into the backfield. The mother then lays upon his hoof, herself and 10 bundles of wheat, freshly sized. She brings her newborn to the horse, who sniffs the slick blood of her placenta on its forehead. If the horse licks the baby, the family's fortunes for the next year were guaranteed. Two licks, and the baby was the next village head. At this point, the horse is slain. Both animal and wheat are ground into flour and baked as bread. 
the mother is given the first loaf. She must then dip it in the reserved horse blood and put the blood bread chunk down her throat. After this ritual is complete, the blood is cooked into a stew, horse bread and bone and all. The villagers would feast into the thick of the night until their bellies rose as far as their mothers did. Number two. Egyptian myth states that the goddess Isis was good. In times of drought, she sends birds with sacks of wheat in their beaks. In flood, their breasts swelled. Once, a pharaoh, who went by the title Master of the Field, ordered every oven in the region to be stuffed with dough. The baked bread was to be thrown into the Nile, an offering to the good goddess herself. The villagers, then hungry from the flood, took the pharaoh's head instead. The master of the fields was buried in the belly of the Nile, which swallowed him whole. Number three. My mother only goes to dinner buffet so she can skip breakfast and lunch. She would get three plates of meat and three of cakes and then go for another round. It was a sound system, but I would stop eating long before she did. At six, she asked if I wanted a younger sibling. No, I said. My fingers were nervous and sticky behind my head. I did not want her to know how I had dipped my bread into the kaya jar. How I had swallowed the entire loaf. Number four, the Romans kept every child alive. They will eat our bread, Julius Caesar mused, and desire to call it their own. Number five, the problem started with the Romans. The problem swelled when they saw my mother mingling and pillaged her. Hannibal was a sprightly general. He dreamt of Roman teeth dissolving in his liver. Even Hannibal wasn't father enough to save his daughter. The Romans galloped where they wanted, brought us fresh grain, wine, God. In Pliny, ground pig bones were a substitute for the flour. My mother's loaves were sour. And the Romans sacrificed her daily bread to their soldiers. The problem persisted. The problem gouged itself into a November baby. The problem stayed. The problem learned the Romans one day and decided to no longer be prey. The problem looked within and chose to be a mother. A murderer baked two loaves and used one to feed her father. Gather the flour, she said. Bake the bone. Observe the gluten pane, cast the window onto two selves. One, the mother we all desire. She needs the door like a familiar womb. We crave the second, the Roman inside us. Puncturing loaves before they rise, a legion taming the Alexandrian wheat, raising every foreign clip, no one remembers which rib belongs to their Sunday roll. No one stares at problem sex and thinks of no one stares at problem bread and thinks of sex. When a spear thrusts, a child puts itself away for the evening. The problem didn't believe in God. Thank you. Thank you, Min. Um, and thank you, Crystal and Renji. Um, before we move on to the second half of the uh, reading this afternoon, I thought I'd ask a few questions for our first batch of readers, um, and maybe we can we can jump off from 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 Min's mouthful of a poem, <laughs> which is kind of really about history, but also about like eating and mothers and mouth, you know. Um, uh, maybe just two general questions for the three of you. Um, and you can answer whichever question might feel more appropriate this, this beautiful afternoon. I'm, I'm interested to know, uh, I noticed that for the three of you, you write about history. Um, so I'm quite interested why, why, why do you like writing about history? My, my, the other question is a bit more general. I'm interested why you like writing poetry. Um, so whichever might be the easier or the harder question to, to answer, um, I think the, the viewers would, would love to know. Like Mian, maybe we can start with you. Like it's a strong word. <laughs> um, I'll take the first question. <laughs> Um, I think I mean as a, I mean I was a history major. Um, I've always been interested in history. History was like the first thing 
that I really, really enjoyed, that I really enjoyed, and poetry sort of was something I discovered afterwards. So it kind of jumped from there as well. Um, I think for me, it's not just about learning the different stories and history, some of which are like way this is me, but also like 6,000 years ago. Um, and learning the patterns there, but also like as an emotionally constipated person sometimes, <laughs> like poetry, like there are things that maybe I don't have the words or capacity to talk about yet, or I don't know exactly what I, what I want to say, and history becomes a useful vehicle in trying to piece together the patterns of my experience and history experience and then when I look back at it I'm like, oh that's what that 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 those are the dreams that come out of me. That's a very useful I wouldn't say useful, but like it's it's just something that I like instinctively choose for me. Um I think for me the my answer to those two questions are very linked. Um and I, I would say that what I enjoy most about poetry and about writing for both writing poetry and writing about history, is the way that poetry allows me to investigate the past and to empathize, to get into different perspectives apart from myself. And I think back well to in, in some of the poems that I read just now, um, it was my attempt, you know, to enter into perspectives different from myself and to write from there. And I find that deeply thrilling for me as a poet to be able to to enter into that to poetry. And and it poetry therefore becomes a way of empathizing it becomes a way of investigation where history is not just a series of facts that I read about in, in a book, but a way of understanding why the present is as such by looking into the past. And I guess, like, you know, without the medium of poetry, I could never enter into the investigation. So, yeah, it, it, it becomes a creative way in which I think about how the past could have been. And I don't find any other medium that, that lends itself so readily to do that as poetry. So I'm still figuring out what history is doing in my writing, so I have to answer the second question. Sure. Um, so I actually write poetry and nonfiction, though I would hesitate to say that I write the essay because I don't think that's something that I always consciously ex explore in my work. Um, I don't know why I like, po like, like writing poetry. I know I love reading it. Poetry is difficult. Um, the, I think maybe talking about my editing process makes sense. So. I find it easy to fill a page. And then when I have to edit the poem and I edit it down, it becomes two lines. And then I have to start again. So I think that subconsciously poetry is the form that really allows me to tap on what I'm thinking about and also forces me to think beyond those. Like page that turns into two lines and then I start working from there and then I see where that goes. So it's very discovery based. It's very experimental. Um, at the same time, I think it really helps me to excavate what I'm thinking about, what I care about, and what my next step is. So that's a process that's really important for me. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you, Min and Renje. Uh, we go to our second half. I think we, we might do some reshuffling, so maybe a, a, a bit of a break. Um, we have Paul, Sean, and Yam coming up next. We will wait for them. Maybe a minute uh, as we change seats. Uh, yeah. And we invite Paul, Sean, and Yams to join us here on the stage.
Okay, uh, welcome back uh, to the second half of our reading, and I'm super excited to, to hear from uh, the next three poets. Um, we have the voices of Paul Jerusalem, Sean Hu, and Yam. Let's welcome them. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Jerusalem, and I go by he, him pronouns. And um, I graduated from Yale and US in 2019. And um, I was a literature major. And uh, I'm always, I've always been very interested in issues of uh, diaspora and queerness and post-coloniality. And I'm actually currently doing my master's at NUS um, under comms and new media. So I'm studying like queer studies and all that jazz. And my interest in poetry is also like along those lines. So yeah, I, I like writing about being in between, being neither here nor there, all that drama, all that who got. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, the first poem I'm going to read, it's called This City is Far Too Small. The city that I say I'm from is a two-bedroom HDB flat I grew up in. The only place my parents said didn't throw us out before the contract was up, just so the landlord could sell it off. Or that first flat they lived in when I was born, when the landlord would sometimes bring her tryst unannounced. I don't blame her. This city is far too small for anything but money-making, family-building, and passionless sex. I shared a room with two brothers and our helper, locking them out on the pretext of hardcore studying when the need to steal what space I could have for soft-core self-discovery. There's nowhere in this city I can call my own. In childhood, I memorized the names of train stations, the only vocabulary for the city that I have. It's not difficult to impress someone who has never had a car in this city. Having a lover with a car has meant I can now find more of my city to love. But everywhere I'm taken by my lover, he's brought someone else before. I want to take him somewhere my parents discovered on their first year here but it's probably no longer there. Forever is but fiction in the two-bedroom HDB rental flat I moved out of when I was 26. The same age, my parents left their country for the city, like them, in search for a better life, somewhere to get married, make children, and keep all of this going. Unlike them, family building is neither a choice nor option, nor architecture. My love for the city can only happen from a distance as it grows too fast for us, but not any bigger. So that was the first poem. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is called, huh, fake accent. Oh, hiya, hello. Is here good? Okay, got it. Okay, so the next accent I'm, uh, the next accent I'm gonna read, the next poem I'm gonna read is fake accent. At times, I have to rehearse my assimilation, checking that my voice is placed not too far front at my teeth. The way I've been raised to convey my thoughts is only constructive in singing someone else's songs. Otherwise, to be too nasal is evidence of bumping. To twirl your R's and L's is proof of roots that have betrayed themselves, writhing the soil. It's poetry of erosion. First by rewriting one's name from Baibayan to Latin, a month later choosing surnames that mean something only in another land. I've done well, well to the point that the only time my singing voice is liberated from the guttural drain is when I'm drunk, witnessing my tongue a serpent shedding Singapore season skin. And the last poem I'm going to read is called Tinder Tourism. The worst part, not our body's incomplete acquaintance, but sober kisses my last night at your city. A lone street lamp, an unwilling witness, knows only now how to measure the miles between us. We know how long distances end, tired of faint endurance, having saved oneself for the marriage of heartbreaks, finally admitting no bridge can cross this, not a river, but a length between two islands. Untangling the origins of our path, 
two right swipes would be the most banal way to put it. Your pun on right can exist only in English, like any proper conversation we can have, even though I've tried to learn your tongue. In truth, we were two marble tiles whose swirls flowed into each other only if you squint hard enough. Tiles in a lodge full of transient occupants, paying in a currency of promises and platitudes like we all do. The worst part was seeing our shadow on the floor, slender but cleft by a wall. We could have reached further than that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your poems. Uh, my name is Sean. Um, I graduated a few months ago. And um, doing poetry in Yo and Yes is it's a very luxurious thing, I think. Like when I come out of Larry's class, like three hours where just like thinking about a line or a word or a poem, I think like how can I ever spend three hours thinking about such a small thing when I'm out of school and indeed like now graduate graduating, like I miss that kind of like structured way of like approaching poetry and like having people to uh, work these poems with together. So um, these poems that I'm reading today, these three or four poems, um, come out of that class. Uh, it's like uh, Larry made us do uh, this chapbook project and mine is kind of about, uh, I would say, re-enchantment and looking at how the urban space of Singapore plays off with like the natural world, so-called. Um, but I think it's also a prism to explore different kinds of legacies like colonial legacies or like authoritarian legacies so I think for me what I do with poetry is I want it to foster a different kind of attention to the world uh, compared to like my normal way of thinking in the world um, so the first poem is kind of part of an extremely long poem but I'm just going to read the first section because I think it's a good way to begin and it's about uh, Raffles losing his natural history manuscript um, so, tame, a wilderness into a garden, a word into a gauntlet. In 1824, the fame flamed off the coast of Sumatra. The ship's tail a bright orange, like the back wing of a scarlet minivet. The rest of the deck like the black of a starling, with each crow member draped and desiccated, knowing that Noah's ark is sinking, and with it, Lady Sophia's heart tuned to E-flat, its throat tightened to sing like a chalampong, looted palaces and chests, jewels, jackets, geopolitical correspondences, the map of Sumatra like a floating arm, the eye of a crested jay shrieking, even other men, and all his dear drawings, like a boy who loses his memory of strange animals in strange postures, all up in flames, like wild grass, is where we begin. So this is where I begin. Uh, it's a very long poem, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the second poem I'm reading is, um, I take it from like a certain myth, um, and uh, it's from this a collection called Zi Fu Yu, which is what the master would not discuss. And it has this 18th century folktale about a man who fell in love with an imperial inspector, and then he sent him to die. Um, but he kind of uh, becomes appointed by the underworld as a god of all uh, forbidden love. So it's kind of trying to use mythology and contemporize it, uh, since he could not do so would be accused of like being westernized or whatever. So um, this poem is called Mempat, after the myth of Wu Tianbao, the rabbit god. A crow dreams of the pink Mempat and is sent to die on a fern. The avian underworld is full of others. A recalcitrant boo-boo who would not stop singing falsehoods. A miner who took too much from a satin hand. A lost egret. They laughed at his story for being sent down. Conferred him the status of the crow who would guard other crows who dream of the pink mampat. The following month, he revealed himself to a citizen of the rain tree. He caught him drinking a mango from behind the morning's folding screen watching as the Mernpap flushed into colour, that those whom we call gods can still know desire, that those who desire may not act on them without a god's impetus. Now the crooks of the underworld have given me the title of guardian, he said, 
that I may be in charge of the crows who delight in without deserving the Mumpak's dowry. The guardian dropped a single seed into the beak of the simple crow, instructed him to plant it where he thinks it's safe. What grows in its place will be a temple for other birds like him. What others like him who have yarned for bearing like that lost egret? When the guardian disappeared, the citizen of the rain tree understood he had to leave for elsewhere. A crow dreams of his own home and is sent to die abroad. Okay. Uh, the third one is, well, it, it's kind of about my experience of being in the choir and uh, uh, growing up thinking about how it's kind of quite an authoritarian place, actually. Not because of the nature of the, the sport, but because of like the way it's done here in this country, I think. So it's kind of a weird one. Um, it's called Landscape with Authoritarian Features. Landscape with the boys in the choir standing like geese. Landscape with geese in lengthening turtlenecks. Landscape with a spotted scorpion waving his finger like a metronome. Landscape with said scorpion curling its tail as if it were playing squirrel. Landscape with an open bill as large and spacious as a cathedral. Landscape with a stingless bee knocking on the roof of the cathedral. Landscape with a boy in a dress made from a traveler's palm. Landscape with green shadows, green eye shadow, a grin in the wings in the shadows. Landscape with black ends ferrying on the back of crotchets. Landscape with a meek throat led astray by black ends. Landscape with the water monitor's paunch on the bank like a revert adjudicator. Landscape with a banded langer hanging at branches like a proud mother. Landscape with the scorpion's five pair of eyes on every judge and jury. Landscape with the first breath, the horned frog leapt. Landscape with geese pronunciation, Latinate, vowels rounded like umlauts. Landscape with the forest flamencos. Landscape with the trophies lined so straight like trees, I believe in the pastoral. Okay, and the final poem. Um, yeah, so after writing this whole thing, I was thinking about like, what to do after this enchantment of this place, uh, making this place filled full of uh, weird creatures and animals and stories and myths. Uh, and I think the word that I come to is that word uh, to rewild. And I'm not interested in like, well, I, I am, but I'm not at that stage where I can be interested about the literal rewilding, but I'm interested in the rewilding of the mind. Uh, so this poem is kind of an ekphrastic poem uh, based off of some of Georgette Chen's still lives. Uh, it's, yeah, asking about what can re Chapman do. So it's called Rewilding. After the green broad bill took its place amongst apples, the mangosteens grew necks and walked off like purple herons onto the wetland of unchopped chives. The pineapples started to grow eyes, watched the suspended bananas ripen into robin, then flightless fall into the rotten nest and mistake the roundest rambutan for their mother's white and bleeding flesh. They almost picked the rock pomelo rind. When the starfish begin, star fruit began misrecognizing the bling at the window for the sun, I tore the discs off and blinded miners started squatting on my sills for damages. They even brought the white-bellied woodpeckers whose bright heads flared unwittingly like the chili oil I smeared in my left eye and see the kitchen top, its long supper table, and every conceivable pigeon is present to the point of pedestrian. What should I believe in next? That the mangoes will begin murmuring themselves into boo-boos? That their hedonistic laughter heralds a new world order? Yet I know to demand that mangoes remain after emergency mangoes, and apples, apples, is a stubborn kind of astigmatism. Amidst all this revision, however, the pheasant remained a pheasant. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those poems, Sean and Paul. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having us. Uh, I'm Yams. I am a writer and musician. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't exactly consider myself a poet, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. I guess I, I write words, and that's what ties us together. Um, and I think it's serendipitous that I come after Sean, because Sean, I always find your, your poems are very lyrical and very pleasing to the ears. <laughs> Hope that I can do that for you all as well. If you came for poetry, I'm going to be playing a song today. So if you came for poetry, I'm, I'm sorry if, I, if, I, if, if this, this 
disappointing. If you want, you can WhatsApp me and I'll send you the lyrics. You can read it as a poem um, and, and tell me how I should change it. Um, I'm going to be doing a song from an album that I'm currently working on. It's called Do You Drive a Nice Car? A song of the album. But first, I'm going to quickly tune my guitar. Do you drive a nice car? Do you drive a nice car? Do you like to go to the spa? Do you sleep alone at night? If your Bible beside, do you have a big house with all the dollars that you compiled? I know you don't understand, that's all right. But do you think about us at night? Dear Mom, I've been thinking about the last time I saw you. Thinking that it was the last time before you cut me off. Off the phone, shut me off, all alone. Never thought I'd be the one without you to call. My best friend said I really did change a lot. My hair length's gone long to short, long to short. Yeah, yeah, long to short, long to short. First two years were the worst. Birthdays, no words said you were a verse too late. The first fake crew up and flew to school. Well, you just sat and tried to sue and take your rap apart with a hard heart. Turned the light to dark because I could not partake in this wake for the love you had. Yeah. Hearing you then only made me mad. Uh. Hearing how you hated that to his guts, that part's alright. Cause he you up, catch you up tight all night. Let me see your face too. 27 years, he was never ever faithful. So you made moves such as hell free. I support that. Work yet, all you need to lose. I would call that natural collateral. Things that make you fall back. But how come when I call, you don't call back? On track to avoid, started when you only cared about the coin. Only had his money on your mind, declined to find peace. Peace of me feels like a sign least tossed aside when you're done since you've won. Yeah. Did you think about the trees that you burned, the tears you've earned? Three and a half years to the days I saw your face. So do you drive a nice car? Do you like to go? I'm scared of the dark, of dreams too faded, seen and shaded by trees cut down too soon, stumps left in the ground. The only sound I hear is light ringing in my right ear, bright lights and white tears, lights singing in your backseat keeping me asleep, too deep to wake up. But when I do, always not by choice, in your packed lunches and wake up calls, I realize I don't recall the sound of your voice. Do you miss me? Or do your dreams sound like ice cream at the mall? Trust falls in empty hallways, tall trees and quiet rides in your car. Beside a slow breeze much stronger, I no longer know who you are. So tell me why I still dream of you.
Um, before I end my, my, my set, I just want to say, no one, no one has said it yet, but I really want to sh shout out Larry. I mean, okay, everyone has shouted out Larry. But I want to shout out Larry. He hasn't read any of his poems today, but he's really a wonderful, wonderful poet who we have all learned so much from. And you also have the chance to learn a lot from him if you buy one of his collections of poetry. <laughs> he had one that just came out last year, I think, if I'm remembering the years correctly. Um, and yeah, so Lawrence Epil, that's spelled exactly how you think it's spelled. <laughs> um, and I guess I should probably shout myself out too. I, I just released an EP uh, called Inconsistent. So if you liked what you heard, you can just check it out on Spotify or iTunes or you know, wherever you're listening to this. KK Box. I don't know what KK Box is, but it's, it's there as well. So yeah. Thank you very much, Yams. Um, before we wrap up, because um, we are about to end, um, maybe it might be nice to hear a bit from our last three readers. Um, just for the sake of equality and justice, maybe I can, you know, uh, ask the same questions too. Um, Kiri, I mean, you know, why poetry? Um, what do you like about writing poetry? Hearing, hearing the three of you also made me think about how important music is, sound in your work, um, but also how important place is in your work. Um, and part of me really wants to ask what, what, what do you like about writing poetry, but also what do you like about writing about this place we call Singapore? <laughs> Sean, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I think I come to poetry like, yeah, like from a place of music first, um, always, and I think it's the kind of the only genre that uh, that holds up to that, like, you can go in like pure music, I mean, pure delight of the sound of a poem before anything else, or just by virtue of it alone. So. I think for me, it's about how we can re-perceive the world, like sonically, even, um, and that there is value in that. I'm, I think like some poems come because you want to say something, and some poems come because you want to say something in a certain way. And most of my poetic course is the latter. I always want to say it a certain way. I have nothing to say, but I have a way to say it. Yeah, that's how I put it. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'll go since. Um, well, song is poetry too, no, but um, I think the question assumes that you like writing in poetry. No, I'm I'm just kidding, but like, I think oftentimes when I'm trying to say something, sometimes it naturally gravitates towards poetry. Sometimes it goes more towards like the essay or like fiction, and I think it's really a matter of what the subject matter or what my feeling um, is nagging at me to do. And I think poetry is actually really frustrating because like with poetry, like you really have to make sure that everything is tight and everything, every single word counts. Um, and of course, that's not to say that for prose, um, you don't have to make every word count. It's just that like, if we were to compare prose and poetry, it's like prose is, fresh milk and poetry is like condensed milk where it's so packed. Like the milk to water ratio is really just so different. Um, but I think what poetry affords that prose uh, or nonfiction or fiction doesn't um, really predispose themselves so well to it is how like poetry is a lot closer to song um, than the other um, forms are. And sometimes when I'm writing, I think something that one poetry workshop I attended by Cyril Wong um, left an impact on me was how like he was talking about writing poetry, like write, like singing a Mariah Carey song. And apart from the fact that I'm a Mariah Carey fan, it just made sense because now when I write, I'm like, okay, where should I put the hasty octave jump? Where should I put the random whistle note that no one really cared about, but now they never knew they wanted in their life. Where should I like have whispers and where should I have like the belt? So I think, yeah, some some like forms of expression just really lend themselves better towards poetry. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I I think writing, I guess writing poetry and writing songs 
songs are, are similar to me in that it's like words on a page, right? With a structure. Um, and I think that allows me to say things, some things that I, I was not before able to say. I think the exercise of condensing your emotions into, to be able to fit on, into that structure of, onto that page um, allows me to understand myself and what I'm feeling and what the things that are affecting me in a way that I couldn't before. So I think for me, art is very much a process of catharsis and a process of, a process of processing. Um, yeah. Great. Um, our time is up. We hope we hope you've enjoyed the the past hour with us. Um, I'm I'm really hoping uh, th those who are are viewing this. Um, I hope you are inspired to write poetry, um, and that you get a sense of its multiple varieties um, and its you know multiple music. Um, thank you for for sharing your time with us, and thank you to all the readers for for coming out this afternoon.